Welcome back to the show. While we discuss the rise of Islamophobia and what are the factors uh, causing it to rise, what is fueling it? Joining us now for this discussion is Yasser Latoyi, who's the head of the Justice and Liberties for All Committee in France, an organization which works for the defense of human rights and civil liberties. He's joins us from Istanbul. We're also joined by Mr. Hijra Saputra, who's an analyst joining us from Kingston. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Uh, Yasser, I'd like to begin with you. Now, we were talking a lot about the factors that are causing for an influence and uh, influence of people, why hate is spreading amongst them. In all of this, I want to understand how important is it for states to create a narrative in which there is a very clear antagonist, and in this case, Muslims being the antagonist. Uh, well, in, in the case of France, and, and as a matter of fact, for almost all Western countries that have a colonial past, uh, Muslims, whether they are coming from uh, Africa, the Middle East, or uh, South Asia, or even Southeast Asia, have always been perceived as a population to either uh, exploit uh, for economic gains, to use uh, for the wars being waged by those countries. And when they were, quote-unquote, welcomed, um, on the uh, Western source, especially in France, they were expected not to ask for the same rights as the majority population. Now, when we say the rise of Islamophobia, I think we are about 30 years late with this term. Now, Islamophobia has settled, at least in the case of France, because Islamophobia has been allowed to become part of the law. Many laws are specifically targeting Muslims today. And what has is thing, make, making things even blatant and even worse today with this uh, rise of white supremacy terrorism is that the, uh, the anti-Muslim rhetoric is no longer being carried by the far right or the usual uh, uh, suspects, the, uh, the new, new fascists, etc. Now it's being carried by the left, uh, political parties, the socialist party, and even today, Emmanuel Macron, who has been giving, giving this idea that he's somehow the shining liberal uh, standing against Trump. But Emmanuel Macron is doing the exact same thing as Trump, demonizing Muslims on the one hand and using them as scapegoats because of social upheaval in France. In other words, because he has been unable to tackle rising inequalities and uh, poverty in France, he's now using the what, what I call Islamo-diversion. You create a Muslim problem to divert public opinion. Right. And you're mentioning many points, and I want to get to them one by one, but I'll start with the point you mentioned earlier in which you linked Islamophobia to the colonial past. Do you think European states, specifically those who were colonizers, are recognizing their attitudes uh, that the post-colonial legacy still continues in this way? Well, actually, it's even, even worse than that. We have had laws passed in Parliament that are calling to praise the colonial era because it was, quote-unquote, an era of civilizing the savages and bringing technology and freedoms to the barbaric peoples of Africa and Asia. So today there is even a sense of pride on the one hand if you are from the right, and if you are from the center parties or the mainstream parties, it's about saying, well, that's part of the past. The problem is that the French Republic, as we know it today, the, the, the so-called Fifth Republic with the 1958 Constitution, was actually a pure product of the colonial era. And it was passed in the midst of the bloody repression of Algerians while they were seeking independence. Now, all the authoritarian measures adopted in the French Constitution today are applied against blacks, Arabs, browns, and as a matter of fact, the whole Muslim population either to keep them away from access to public education, to, from health care, from housing, and now being used as the enemy within. What's really troublesome with this is that France has a, a near history of you know, massacring the Jews using the term the enemy within and not learning from the past what has been applied to Jews in terms of demonization and calling them the enemy within and passing laws of exception today is being used against Muslims and not by a far-right government, by a, cent um, you know, a centrist or center-right government like that of Emmanuel Macron and right. François Hollande, a socialist president, just two years before that. Right. Uh, Yasser, I'm going to get back to you and talk to you about the point you mentioned about how 
uh, Muslims are being used as scapegoats for many of the problems we're seeing right now. But before that, I want to bring uh, uh, Hijra into this conversation. Hijra, following from what Yasser is talking about, how an enemy within is created, do you feel like that's something that you can relate to with your experiences, with your observations, that Muslims are seen to be the enemy within? Yes, uh, kind of, um, you know, the Islamophobia and things, um, it's uh, started with the issue that, you know, um, to hate Muslim and then uh, to blame Muslim with something that uh, really, really not related to the Islam and Muslim um, uh, itself. So, for example, I don't know how it happened. We need to understand why, uh, for example, Islamophobia is happened. For example, um, this is like, uh, I don't know, like Western, for example, uh, government and uh, state is like um, put Islam as, um, as uh, right. need to be um, as the, the, the enemy. Right. So, so uh, and then, Hijra, as you're mentioning uh, here, that it is important to trace uh, the reasons as to why this is happening. I'd like to show a video of the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, that he gave uh, in the United Nations General Assembly, in which he highlighted the issue of Islamophobia, and he put across a point in which he felt, and which many nations feel, is the reason why it's increasing. Let's take a listen to it. Certain Western leaders equated terrorism with Islam. Islamic terrorism. Radical Islam. What is radical Islam? There is only one Islam. And that is the Islam we follow of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no other Islam. Terrorism has nothing to do with any religion. So, Yasser, from what the Prime Minister here stated in a very assertive manner that uh, religion has nothing to do with terrorism and that the reason for Islamophobia is because many world leaders equated uh, uh, terrorism with Islam. Now, here I want to understand what are the motives of states when they do something like this. You earlier mentioned the term scapegoats uh, and using Muslims as scapegoats. Does this relate to any of this? Uh, well, first, uh, uh, we, ha we have to remember that uh, Western interventions in Muslim countries have created the various terrorist groups we have seen in the past 20 years. They were not manufactured by Muslims themselves, uh, that be it British for intelligence or, you know, or the US or France, they have all used some, all kinds of groups to either destabilize uh, countries or destroy countries like Iraq and with the power of vacuum leading to the emergence of various terrorist groups, quote, for, for example, Daesh between Iraq and, uh, and Syria. Now, these Western powers, in, in, instead of them taking the, their responsibilities as so-called leaders of the free world, they are blaming their respective Muslim minorities for the foreign policies and the disastrous foreign policies they are leading, over which Muslims have no control over whatsoever. Now, when they call, for example, and say radical Islam, I'm going to refer, for example, to the French Senate, and they admit uh, officially that they have no definition of the word radicalization. And they do admit, quote unquote, and I, I spoke about it in my report of 2017 on Islamophobia in France, that the term has been adopted under the pressure of current events. Now, you don't see the word radicalization being applied, for example, against white supremacy terrorists. You don't see the word radicalization being applied to Israel, to, uh, to Jewish youngsters joining the Israeli army. And yes, sir, here's, uh, sorry to interrupt, but here's when I, uh, where I want to push this question. Why is it that uh, this is also equated when we see terrorist attacks uh, committed by white supremacists, white nationalists, and at increasing frequency. Why is there this double standard? What narratives are allowing for this double standard to exist? Because, you know, you, you, you quoted, uh, uh, you spoke about, and I thank you for that, white supremacy. Well, that's what it is. It's supremacy, which means the evil and evildoers are not part of us. It's always the other side. So, for example, uh, uh, three years ago, the socialist president, Francois Hollande, tried to change the French, the French constitution and to allow the French state to strip of their citizenship uh, terrorists, and of course, you know, people who are identified as radical Muslims from their French citizenship. 
in a sense that if they do evil, they are not part of us. So today we see that the, the so-called counter-terrorist measures are only applied for two reasons. Of course, to, to speak to public opinion and say, look at what we are doing. We are targeting those bad terrorists. Of course, those terrorists are always Muslims. They cannot be white folks joining, for example, various you know, white supremacy militias. And the second one, we have to look even beyond the measures being applied. For example, France and many Western countries are sitting on social time bombs and they are expecting an, an outburst of social unrest. Now, for the French state to be able to jugulate and mitigate those social upheavals, as you are seeing it, for example, with the Yellow Vest movement, the state needs extraordinary powers. Now, they're not going to say we need extraordinary powers to beat down your kids when they, when they march for employment and decent, decent wages. No, we are seeking extraordinary powers because those evil Muslims are challenging our peace. Now, problem is that... The, uh, the white majority population, be it in the UK, France, or the US, for example, they feel safe as long as the, the, their governments are, are targeting Muslim minorities. But at the end of the day, once you pass a law, the law is applied against everybody. So we have here, to sum things up, two points we have to highlight. The first one being that we are moving towards authoritarian uh, liberalism which means we're going to have neoliberal policies being applied by authoritarian states. And the second one, we need to constantly challenge public opinion by telling them the problem is not us um, uh, ripping you off your benefits and allowing tax evasion, etc., but your Muslim neighbor who's wearing a headscarf and therefore a direct threat to you. Right. Yasser, you've mentioned a number of points that are very interesting and they're worthy to pick up on, uh, pick up on and discuss them further. But the point that I do want to take to um, uh, Hijra is talk to him about this threat that is being created and the narratives that are being created. In all of this, is there space for Muslims and for minorities to engage, uh, to have meaningful discourse with those who are... Uh, perpetrators of this violence, or is there any space for them to give their narrative? Well, Michal, um, it's really kind of a dilemma when Muslim uh, become a victim and then always be blamed and then uh, put as the enemy. But no matter what the uh, white government, Western government, try to um, create a uh, negative image about always Muslim around the world, they understand, and then they try to understand uh, this is a kind of uh, political things, and then they don't want to be reacted or um, negatively. So um, Muslim around the world, uh, um, it depends on the um, the Muslim leader um, in their local country trying to make calm the situation and things. So right. uh, this is, the, yeah. Right. On that point, thank you so much, Mr. Hijras Pusra, for joining us and talking to us. Uh, Yasser, just a last question to you. Now, when we're talking about all of this, and this is a question I raised earlier as well, but I do want to bring it up again. Now, Brookings had a very interesting project in which they put out a number of uh, research papers. They were titled The 1% Problem, Muslims in the West and the Rise of the New Populist, in which they talk about how Muslims make up 1% to 8% of the population, and yet so much of the narrative is constructed around them and they're seen to be the enemy in all of this. Are we assuming that the people, the listeners, the viewers, those in the general community are not fighting back against this political rhetoric? Well, it depends. If you're talking about the, the majority population in Western countries, no, they are not you know, fighting or pushing back against it because to them it's a problem specific to minorities. And because there is a rampant idea that Muslims don't belong here in France or there in the UK or in the US, to them it's like, oh, well, you know, at best they're going to say it's bad, but what, what can we do? And at worst they're going to be like, okay, then these, uh, these Muslims are problematic and the government is right. Now, what the, the majority of population misses is that uh, you will be affected one day by what Muslims are undergoing today. And to make things even clearer for, for, the, uh, for the wider audience, today Muslims in Western countries are the, bar uh, the barometer of the state of democracy and the rule of law. Because states 
it's always need a scapegoat to set a precedent. But once that precedent is accepted, it becomes applicable to everybody. Now, for example, right. in France, they passed the state of emergency. Yes, they passed all these violent measures against Muslims, but three months down the road, they applied them against environmental workers, against the anarchists, against the union leaders, and right. even against political opponents. So today, Muslims, because they are losing their rights and freedoms, and because people are remaining quiet, are you know are just being the first witnesses of the rise of highly authoritarian states. And that's no coincidence right. that, for example, countries like India, um, um, yeah, sir. Now, I'm taking your point there, that is an entire point, and that's where I'm going to have to end the show since we've run out of time. But that is an important point that the laws and regulations that are made today against one minority will, of course, subsequent, subsequently impact other minorities in the future, and that is something that we're seeing unfold before our eyes. On that point, thank you so much, Mr. Yasser Latoi, for joining us. We're, uh, we're going to end the show. Thank you so much for watching Indus Special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.